Aggression is one of the last dirty words in our culture. You can be crass, you can be rude, you can even be profane, but ho oh, ho, aggressive, don't be aggressive, except it's wrong, dead wrong. I promise you nothing of meaning and transcendence will come into your life passively. It's time for you to get into the arena to push back against a passive, mediocre existence. I'm Brian Tome, and this is The Aggressive Life. Welcome to The Aggressive Life. You know, there's a lot of things that we think of as aggressive. Obviously, if you're going to do MMA, that's pretty aggressive. If you're going to choose a high-risk stock, that's that's pretty aggressive. If you're going to, and I could go on and on and on and on. We, we, we know those classic aggressive things, and, I, and I'm pro many of those classic aggressive things. We've had them on the podcast, but today we're going to delve into something that's um, categorized as non-aggressive, but it is aggressive. We're going to dabble into how to enjoy your freaking life. <laughs> how do you enjoy your life? Wait, 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 wait. Enjoying my life is aggressive? Yeah, actually it is because the way culture operates, everyone's trying to take something from somebody. There is a giant sucking sound that is trying to suck our energy, trying to suck all the spare time out of our schedule, trying to suck all the joy and laughter that we have. And very few of us are actually enjoying our life. You have one life to live. You need to figure out how you can aggressively enjoy your life. I'm not telling you you need to go to Las Vegas. I'm not telling you you need to spend more money on play pursuits. I'm not telling you you need to restructure your life today. All I'm going to do is I'm going to raise a flag and say, oh, here's one voice over here that might be saying you might be following a script that everybody else is following and it's not working. Don't passively follow the script that everybody else is following that says you have to work 60 hours a week in order to have a life of meaning. Don't follow the passive script that says playing is for children. No, no, no. And therefore I'm not going to play. Don't follow the passive script that says I need to sock away vast hordes of my money so I can retire. And then I play all that's wrong. All that is BS. All that is leading to our declining health scores. All of that is leading to our declining happiness scores. All of that is leading to people who personally, I don't want to spend time with. I want to spend time with people who are enjoying their life. And I want to give you permission today to enjoy your life. Can I hear three cheers for enjoying your life? Hip, hip, hooray. Hip, hip, hooray. Hip, hip, hooray. So today on The Aggressive Life, I have a personal favorite with me in the studio, a personal friend. I don't need to look at producer notes as to what we should talk about. I know this man pretty well. We've been close friends for a while. His name is Kirk Perry. He spent 23 years at Procter & Gamble working his way up through the marketing and general management. He is recently, most recently for six years, been working with Google. He's the president of Brand Solutions. He's a graduate of the University of Cincinnati. He's been awarded the business school's high highest honor, the Carl H. Linder Award for Outstanding Business Decision. He's a dear friend, and his life is a testament to the power of aggressive moves. Kirk Perry, welcome to The Aggressive Life. Thanks, PT. Good to be here, my man. Yeah. Well, let's go back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. Your story and your insights you're going to give us today, I think, make most sense when looking at the backdrop of your life. Tell us about your early life growing up. So my mom and dad, um, blue collar Ford Motor Company employees, you know, lived month to month. And, you know, my dad would joke that we ran out of money before we ran out of month. And it just imbibes in you just a hunger um, because I, I never wanted to be on their side of that because, you know, I, I will never forget we we're living in Detroit. My dad had to leave the state to work. And uh, my grandfather one Sunday brought over some food for us because, you know, my dad was out of the state. And I remember he came in the door came around the corner and we had sold all of our furniture. We had a TV on milk crates. My brother and sister and I were laying on the floor and he couldn't see us, but we could see him. And he had this look on his face of shock and 
almost disgust. Like, I can't believe how far they've fallen so fast. And I remember him dropping that food off. And I didn't think it at that moment. But over time, I remember thinking, like, I am never going to let this happen in my life. And that that was kind of the start of this. He sold your furniture so you could make bills? My, my parents did. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we, you know, we could, we could just eat and survive. And it was, like I said, it was, it was day to day. And it just make, gives you an appreciation for life in a very, very different way. Because you, you know, I, I know what it's like to struggle to, and it didn't last forever. I mean, it was 12 to 18 months, but it was long enough where I could feel what that was like. Right. And you going to college was a huge aggressive move for you. How many people in your family have been to college before you went? Zero. Yeah, zero my entire extended family. And, you know, I took a year and a half off between high school and college. I worked as a manager in a Wendy's restaurant, and I always knew that I had to go to college because I had more potential than, you know, nothing wrong with being a Wendy's restaurant manager, but I knew I had more in me than that. And so I was working 60 hours a week, and I started going to the University of Cincinnati full-time. And, uh, you know, and I, I literally would take a week vacation during finals week to be able to take finals and be able to study. But that's how I got through my first year plus of college was full-time work, going to school full-time, because I had that vision. I knew that I needed to, to finish college, and I knew that it was going to be hard as hell for, for that time that I had to do that. Now, someone at UC noticed you and did something that was an incredibly aggressive move that changed your life and changed in the process, I might even say, millions of lives. Yeah, I was in a business law class, and I had closed the night before to Wendy's, and you know, I got home at 3 in the morning, and this was a 9 a.m. class. And uh, her name was Ilsa Hawkins, Professor Hawkins. And, and I loved that class, and I always thought I wanted to be a lawyer. And I remember she called on me, and I, I was half asleep. And I was, you know, she goes, Mr. Perry, welcome to the class, or something like that. And afterwards, I went up to apologize to her, and I said, hey, I'm really sorry, and told her what happened. And she said, have you ever thought about going to law school? And I said, man, I, I'm just, I'm thinking about going to night school, because here, here's my situation. I explained it to her in a couple of minutes, and she said, hey, go talk to Clyde Parrish, who's the assistant dean of students, and tell him your story, and see if he can help you out. And so, you know, I wandered down there, and I was getting ready to make an appointment, and the, you know, the assistant said, well, he's busy for the next four to six weeks. And do you want to set it? I thought, you know, this is typical. Like, so that's okay. And as I said that he was coming around the corner and he overheard the conversation. He said, do you have a minute now? And I said, sure. And so I went back and sat down 10 minutes, explained to him, you know, I'm working full time. I'm going to school full time. I've got a 4.0 after the last year. And here's my family background. He said, I'll be back in a minute. Comes back in and he brings this piece of paper and he said, hey, I'm going to give you a full ride academic scholarship for the next year. And it's renewable provided you continue to get the grades you have. And second, that you make a difference while you're on campus. Do you want to accept it? And, you know, I didn't think about it. I just signed <laughs> signed the bottom of that paper. But he literally, she and he together changed the trajectory of my life. Because instead of going to night school, working full time and taking 10 years to get through school, they put me on a course to graduate in the normal time to get really involved on campus, which showed me that I had leadership potential and gave me the opportunity now to give back to that place that, you know, literally changed my life. So it's unbelievable, man. It is unbelievable. I mean, I think about that with with the academic world and not the academic world. Any world where you've got a bunch of staff people and budgets, no one wants to put their neck out and make a decision without getting group buy-in and all yeah. the, and it, the, the, the guts that that took I, I was amazing. I didn't appreciate it until many years later, you know, and as a senior at school, I was a student body president. And I remember being involved in the bureaucracy of the university thinking what he did for me, like to not have to go to a committee and have all my credentials. He on the spot gave me a full tuition scholarship unheard of, incredible. You know, I, I call him one of my angels and, and Professor Hawkins, one of my angels of UC because they just literally plucked me out of nowhere and gave me this incredible gift and blessing. You Amazing. Know, I could never repay them for. And you are impacting through your job at Google, millions of people and leading to the destruction of the American way of life. <laughs> it's always good to be with you, Brian. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You know, I, I, I'm obviously, a, I'm, I'm a fan of Google, but man, there's stuff that always floats out there about, oh, Google's doing this. Give us your, 
before we get into other stuff here, just give us your two minute stump speech on why Google's a great company and people are just too uptight. You know, here's the thing, like change is always hard. When you look at the history of economics, whenever there's an upheaval in society, there's always nervousness about what the future may bring. When you look at the shift from agrarian to the industrial economy, industrial economy, the service economy, and the service economy to the information economy, which is where we are now, people always look and say, oh, they're the ones changing it and they're the ones doing it. And the reality is, I, I mean, I worked for an amazing place in P&G for almost 24 years, incredibly principled, 177 years as a company. I will tell you, Google is every bit as principled, every bit as focused on doing well by doing good as P&G was. And so I live inside of that company. I see the decision making at the very highest levels. And I can tell you that people want to make the world a better place. I mean, the founding of the company was how do we do really cool stuff that improves the world? And so understandably, society is worried about, oh my gosh, AI, it's going to, it's going to eliminate my job or, oh my gosh, they're doing this and it's going to change the way I work. And it, and it may. And, and the challenge for our society is to figure out how do we help people who are in that in-between as we move from one economy to another. But it isn't the fault of a company or it isn't the fault of an economy. It's the way the world works. And we have to help people get there. But it really is an incredible company. And the, the things we don't talk about that we do that impact people's lives every day. Like when's the last time you paid for something from Google? Mm. Your email, your search, your videos, whatever. Yeah, some people might buy something on Google Play, but we provide free stuff to people so that they can improve their lives and efficiency. I mean, I learned how to work on my car from YouTube. Mm. You know, I, I, we can find out what's open and what's on the shelf on Google search. I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing company that's really all about improving people's lives. Now, you said it's the way the world works. What did you mean by that? Well, I, I, what I mean is progress always means there's transition points in the way the world works. There's always, again, throughout history... There are these pivot points where society was scared and nervous about what was coming because you don't know, you know, failure, it always feels like failure in the middle, mm -hmm. right? As you change from one thing to another, you don't know how the end's going to look like or what the end's going to look like. And so it feels scary and it feels like failure because people are unsure of what they've known and how that'll translate into what they don't know. And I think that's that's always the challenge we face. If you are opting into a discussion on aggression, then you have to be for change because that's what aggression is. Yeah. Aggression is, I'm changing something. I'm changing my life. I'm going someplace. And I think that that's where most of the most of the fear comes around is we have too large of a segment of our population that just doesn't want change. If you want change, you're going to have to do something different and stick your neck out and feel like yeah. a failure for a, por for a portion of time. You know, the only, the only thing I push on a little bit, Brian, is I agree with you 100% what you just said, 100%. But I think, at least for me, I mean, I'm super aggressive in pretty much every aspect of my life. It doesn't mean I'm not afraid. And it doesn't mean, you know, my stomach doesn't churn when I make big decisions. Like, I'm nervous about it. But I also know that without taking that aggressive risk, you're not going to have great things happen to you, right? And so it doesn't mean you won't be scared or won't be nervous. It just means that, you know, you're stepping into the unknown a little bit. That's what being aggressive means. I mean, there's no, you know, there's a continuum of I'm really conservative to I'm really aggressive. And it's all about how much risk you're willing to assume. And it's the risk reward of if I do this, what's the reward that I potentially get from taking that risk? I mean, that's how... At least my calculus works. Yeah. So you said you make some aggressive moves. Just share some. What, what are some aggressive moves for Kirk? Maybe start with the first one. It's pretty, uh, it doesn't seem that aggressive now, but at the moment, leaving a stable company where you understood your job and stock options and family, yada, 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 in Cincinnati to go to where you knew nobody in Silicon Valley and the big, bad, oogly, boogly Google, that's a pretty aggressive move. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was probably the scariest decision I ever made um, for many reasons. But, you know, I, I really felt God leading me there. And I saw how cliche that sounds like, oh, God was leading me. But I, I know he was. And, you know, for me, when I lean into what God tells me to do, it's aggressive and it's scary because I, I don't know why or, what, you know, the, the genesis behind him wanting me to go. But I knew, um, you know, we always said we were planted, we were growing, and we were content. Our friends were here, our family was here, our faith community was here, and I was involved in coaching, not for profits. I mean, it was, I mean, we couldn't have been happier here. And then when the call came from Google and we started having the conversation, I didn't want to go. I mean, I tried to create reasons not to go. And at every turn, God left these breadcrumbs for me. And it was only looking back that I saw those breadcrumbs because in the moment, I'm like, I, I got to show God this isn't where I need to go or 
you know, I don't want to move because, and I made up all these reasons, but ultimately in going and letting go and really saying, okay, God, I trust you. There's a reason I don't see it. My first year sucked Mm. for many reasons. It was, you know, a senior level move into a different industry away from that company that I knew. And I was a golden child in to, to having to start all over again in my mid forties and to uproot my family. I mean, you name it, we changed everything. And I think there were many things that happened after I got there. I realized, okay, I'm starting to see why God put me here, but it wasn't always self-evident that first year. And I mean, we had many conversations. I'd call you and like, oh, dude, I I don't know. I don't know. Just getting used to the culture where like the F-bomb is used in every meeting multiple times, just in its own big deal. That was like for you coming from PL. Whoa, what was that all about? You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's not only that. It's just being in a place like the Valley where it's just a different, different culture, you know, where it's not people walking down the street, looking you in the eye and saying, hello, it's not people on Sundays going to church and spending time with their family. It's it just, everything in our life was turned upside down, everything. And it just, but it, it just, and as I look back, it was, it was an aggressive move because I listened to God and I followed really a prompting and a calling that 30 years earlier in my life, I would have never done. Um, people, and people said, yeah, I think you're foolish for leaving PNG. And, you know, I don't know if this is a good move for you. And I mean, I got all the negative and very little positive. I mean, you and a couple of your friends were the very few who said, Hey, if you feel like God's calling you there, it's the right thing to do. That was aggressive. What else would Kirk Perry do in the span of a year that someone else might not do that's aggressive? Well, I'll give you one serious and one silly. Um, you know, we, uh, one of the aggressive moves, this is a serious one, early in my career is I went to South Korea and then Japan for a total of six years. I grew up, you know, a little bit of my background, not having a lot of money. When I graduated from the University of Cincinnati, I'd never been west of Chicago or east of New York. And if someone would have told me I would have spent six years of my life in Asia, I would have laughed at them. But it was, I had an opportunity to stay in Cincinnati, to go to Brussels, Belgium, or to go to Korea. And I'm like, you know what? If I'm going to go overseas, I'm, I'm going to the road less traveled. I'm going to Korea. And I can remember the first month there, I was like, I drive home at night, like, what have I done? I could recognize not a single letter of the alphabet. The smells were different. The culture was different. Everything couldn't have been more different for me. But, but it changed the trajectory of my career. What would normally take somebody between 14 and 17 years to get promoted into as a general manager at PNG, I got promoted in 10 and a half years. So I dramatically accelerated my career because I took this really bold move. And I remember, again, people advising me again. My dad's like, why do you want to go to Korea? You know, the only two things I know about Korea are MASH and CNN headline news. Those are the only two things I know about Korea. (laughs) And Stone Bowls. Yeah, yeah, Stone Bowls. Though your dad probably doesn't even know about Stone Bowls. No, I don't know about Stone Bowls. You don't know about Stone Bowls? You're talking about Hot Pots for for Beep and Bop? Oh, my God. Yes, I'm talking about amazing Korean food that comes in the hot Stone Bowls. You've never been to Korea. They don't call them Stone Bowls. What do they call it? Uh, They call them Beep and Bop, which is the food that goes in the Hot Pot, but Uh, they don't call them Hot Pots. uh, Try to act all cultural on me. All right. and, and so, so that was an example in my life where I, you know, I was 30, we were 30 year old expatriates with two young kids and the last cold, cold war zone in the world between North and South Korea. It was incredible. Best growth experience in my life. Another thing that would be aggressive, we moved back. And one of the things we always knew we wanted to do when I was little, my grandma used to tell me the three things no one can ever take away from you, your education, your experience and your memories and everything in my life since then, I mean, again, not intentionally, but I think as I look back, really geared around those things. Like, yeah, we have nice stuff, but we really try to create experiences and memories and really value education in our lives. And uh, so we wanted to buy a lake house to create the experience and memories for our kids. And we'd never owned a lake house. I'd been water skiing once in my entire life. Um, So we show up, we buy a house, (laughs) like one of the first three houses we see, we buy it, we buy a boat. Never driven a boat before. Oh, you bought that boat? You never driven. Never driven a boat this before. Is not, this is not like now with your Google dollars. This was way back. No, this, this, is, is, this was in 2005, yeah. so a while ago. And, you know, so we struggled. Like, people were <laughs> like, a, you bought a boat. Yeah. And you, you, oh, never, never done it before. But where did you get the idea that, oh, I want to have a house on a so, lake with a boat? So one of the things I try to do in my life is really learn from other people. Like, and 
these old, uh, try to find older friends who kind of had experiences in life, and they said, "Hey, if you can get your kids in the back seat of the car when they're teenagers with their friends and listen to them, and you know, have the opportunity to spend time with them, and great ways to do that." And they give example of, and I didn't want to be, you know, traveling soccer team because that didn't seem like fun to me. Burning every weekend, we had friends of ours who had a lake house. They said it's the greatest thing because even though they may resist, they love bringing their friends. It creates great car time because you're driving. So we're like, oh, lake house. So we were overseas. We saved our money and knew that we were going to put that money toward buying a lake house. And so we show up, we go to this lake and I'm like, and I was watching neighbors do, you know, ski. So I'm like, all right, get up on two skis pretty easily. It wasn't a big deal. So I'm like, I noticed people slalom skiing. So I'm going to freaking learn how to slalom ski. So it took me an entire summer, an entire summer. But by the end of that summer, I was getting pulled out on a ski and that's harder to do when you're older, but it's, still my rite of passage every year to slalom ski. Like, okay, I'm still youthful enough to get up on one ski. That seems like a silly example, but I always try to learn something new every year and do something very different. You know, you got me back on a motorcycle many years ago yeah. when we were doing the, I think it was a play journey. You're like, hey, I want to share with you my love of motorcycles. And I had ridden when I was 18, but hadn't been on one for 20 years. And so we went out riding that day and I, <laughs> I didn't have my license. I didn't know how to ride that thing. And we ended up spending half a day riding the motorcycle, yeah, which then right. prompted me to Get a motorcycle, again, in California. And in California, it's the only state in the union where you can do what's called lane splitting. And if you've ever driven in California, motorcyclists can legally go between moving vehicles on the highway. God bless America. I love it, man. Yes. Um, but interesting, back to aggressiveness, right? It's not a stupid... I, I, I went and did some research on it. And, you, and what I learned is California has one of the lowest per capita registered motorcyclist death rates in the United States. A couple reasons. One is... Helmet laws, right? You got to have a helmet on out there. I know you're opposed to that, but I, I personally I'm like it. I'm not opposed to it. Um, the second thing is they allow you to lane split. And, and their logic is most accidents occur from behind for motorcyclists because your eye in heavy traffic goes to the outside of the car in front of you. And if it's a narrow motorcycle and behind another car, a lot of people get rear-ended and crushed. So California has a low rate. And so if you do it right, if you train for it, if you prepare yourself, you can actually do it fairly safely. And so Cuts my commute time in half. It's a, like the first couple of times I did, I remember calling you after one of them right. like, dude, I'm soaked through with sweat. That was the most nerve wracking ride I've ever had. And today when I do it, I don't even think much about it anymore. I mean, I'm careful, but it's because I've, you know, leaned in aggressively. And then as you get better at it, it kind of moves your, you know, your risk level back. So those are some examples. Uh, you don't aspire to be a CEO. Mm -hmm. And you've turned down, at least to date, every opportunity that's come by your way. That that doesn't sound very aggressive. You know, it's it's funny, Brian. I, I've been so blessed to work for the companies I have and jobs I've had. I, I, I can't, I, you know, when I was a kid, I, I was telling my 18-year-old this the other day. When I was a kid, I didn't. I didn't have many dreams. I didn't, I didn't have anybody to look to to say, oh, I'm going to be that person or, oh, I want to do this. I had just very short-sighted, low self-esteem look at life. And so as I've gotten in, I remember when I started at PNG, I said, man, I want to be a general manager. And 10 and a half years in, ting, I've got it. Like, oh, what do I do now? And then it was, oh, I'm, maybe I want to be a president. But I never said, oh, I want to be the CEO of PNG never once. And for me, it was always a function of like, what do you have to trade off to get those jobs, right? What, what do you have to give up? And there's always a trade off. And for me, and, and there's more to the story, but for me, like, my family is the most important thing in, in my life. Um, my earthly life is my family. And I feel like you do have to trade off time with your family. And and there's things that they they sacrifice for you. And I feel like with my jobs already, they've sacrificed a lot. I travel a lot. We've lived overseas for six years. We moved away from the place we love for the last almost six years. So my family sacrificed a lot already. And and most of the time, it comes back to like an ego thing where I'm like, oh, I'm intrigued by this because, oh, I'm going to be a Fortune 100 CEO. And But like, do I need any more titles? Do I need any more money? Do I need – like, what, why do I want that? Like, what am, what am I willing to sacrifice to have that? And I'm not saying I won't be. I'm just saying that it, it would have to be something where I felt like God was really calling me to do that for a higher order purpose. I think what's what's for me is most intriguing about the aggressive choices you've made, and that relates to the CEO decision, is you have a zest for enjoying life. Mm. There is a 
there is an aggressive attitude to just living your freaking life and enjoying it. And I, I told you many times when I first met you that you were one of the very few people at Procter & Gamble that I actually would like to spend time with, mm. that you could, you could detach, you could laugh, you could... You, you just had a different persona about you. I think that's one of the most impressive things about you. I, I actually think that's part of why you're having the business successes that you do have. There's there's this healthy element of play in your life. Hmm. Uh, you're, you're at the top and you could be taking another mountain and maybe you will take another mountain in your occupation, but you're enjoying your life. Aggressively means enjoy your life. Yeah. If you see something you want to do that makes no sense at all, do it anyway. You know, it's interesting, BT. I, you know, when I, when I joined P&G, I worked like a dog, you know, six days a week was a normal schedule for me. And then we had kids and maybe it wasn't, six days, but it was five and a half. I'd bring my oldest, who's now 26, to the office with me on Saturdays and put her in the playpen and I'd work. And and you know the story, but when she was six, my oldest um, was diagnosed with kidney cancer and it was it was a horrific six months for us. And it was it was an epiphany on many fronts, but really it was my faith awakening. And, and it was also the realization that, man, today's called the present because it's a gift. And and, and you have to appreciate it. And it isn't just working. Oh, that's good. I catch you what you did. The present. Because yeah, it's a gift. Yeah, I like that. Uh-huh. I like that, yeah. Um, but it is a gift. And and so it taught me to to not to, to work hard, but to play hard. And I worked hard, but I was terrible at playing. Like, I, I didn't I didn't understand the concept of rejuvenation. And, and having those things would stretch me outside of, you know, what I do every day, really make me who I am. And so whether it's learning how to water ski or riding my motorcycle or going to, you know, Vegas with my buddies or whatever it is, like I, I want to play as hard as I work. And, you know, in a lot of ways that's made, I think made me a better person because it allows me to, to detach and to get re-energized. Because if I was all work all the time, I mean, I was, I was successful and I was growing, but what was interesting is I became more balanced after my daughter's illness and really started playing as hard as I worked, like my career went even faster, mm. which is odd, right? I didn't think that would happen, but it did. And for me, that was a lesson. And you, you can't just be one dimensional in your life. You've got to be aggressive in all aspects of your life, including how you spend your time outside of work. I think this is a great one for us because I think we all have our our pet project where that's where we're aggressive. I'm aggressive at work or I'm aggressive on the football field or I'm aggressive in, you know, my finances, always putting in the riskiest funds or something. But uh, when you can find someone who consistently sees that if I push it and I do something that's uncomfortable right here, that could bring me results. I think that's that's really admirable. Mm -hmm. And especially, as you said, so, so well, when we push like that, it we never get an immediate payoff. We always feel immediately like this was a failure. We've got to wait for the payoff if there's going to come a payoff at all. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. The analogy I use for people, um, when I think about doing things that are uncomfortable or aggressive, and I'm not sure how they're going to end, I talk about the first marathon I ran in my training plan. You know, it was an 18-week training plan, and I wasn't a runner, but I did it like, I want to get in shape. And I always had on my bucket list run a marathon. I thought, I just want to do one. And I had this training plan, and the first week my long run was five miles. I remember finishing five miles thinking, there is no way I'll do 26.2, no way. But I trained properly and pushed my body and pushed myself over the course of 18 weeks. When I actually ran the marathon, it was easier than the training because the training I put in prepared my body for that event. And like anything we do in our life, you've got you've to grow your way into things. And it's not comfortable. I mean, there were days I remember I'd get up at 4.30 in the morning on Saturdays around I'm like, what? what am I doing? Why am I doing this? But I had a goal and I'm like, I'm going to work, you know, so it's playing hard. It wasn't, it wasn't something I had to do, but something like, Hey, I'm going to push myself to do this. And, you know, we had dinner last night and I'm on this three week, um, alcohol, bread, sugar, you know, not a lot of red meat fast. Not because I have to. Stupid fast. I agree. Utterly stupid fast. But, but for me, it's like, I just, I just want to, I want to have the discipline in my life where I can do things like that. Just give things up or like mentally be able to, so I just constantly push myself and stoop, you know, stupid things. Um, but just to make sure I'm fully engaged in life and not just cruising through because man, life is such an amazing thing. I want to soak it in every moment I have. And like I said earlier, I, I pinch myself every day when I wake up, I'm like, God, thank you for giving me this, 
you know, unbelievable life I have to experience the things I've had. No matter if it ends tomorrow or not, like I, I've lived three lives in one. So I'm super grateful for that. So at a prestigious award that you had gotten at the University of Cincinnati, it's got to be a thrill to be invited back to the school that gifted you a scholarship. And is. now they're wooing you because, you know, you've got just great stuff to offer the organization and others. It, it, that's got to be huge. You, you said in your basically acceptance speech that leadership is being authentic, humble, and vulnerable. Hmm. Those are things. Those aren't three synonyms that the average person would think of for an aggressive, successful leader. Vulnerable, humble, and authentic. Hmm. Why those words? You know, I, I think I, I've had the blessing of having some incredible leaders. And, and I think the problem in our society is we get leader and manager confused. Like a manager, you can get things done because of your title and making people do things. They do it because they have to. They get a paycheck and, you know, you lead a big church and if you wanted something done here, you'd say, hey, go do this. And people would do it because that's, you know, your job and they that's their job and they would have to do it. A leader to me means people want to follow you and do it because they believe in you and they because they believe in you, they want to trust you and they want to give you their very best effort. And, and that's an important distinction to me because in the businesses I've led where it's been the most challenging, what I get the most satisfaction of is like, that's the year the culture scores go up in our annual surveys, because even in the toughest times, um, they feel the most valued. And so when I was, I remember when I was a little kid, my great grandfather, I had the good fortune of having him alive till I was 18. And he wasn't, you know, he got his, uh, he got his GED when he was 60 years old, and his associate's degree when he was 65, Southerner, you know, Great Depression era. I mean, just like incredible story. But he pulled him in. I remember he said to me once, who you are as a man is how you treat other people that don't have value in the moment for you. And, you know, I'm a little kid. I'm like, well, what's he talking about? But as I, as I kind of came into my own and learning about what leadership means, it means you treat your assistant and the person at the front desk and the person in the parking garage equally as well as you do your CEO because they matter too. And I think leaders aren't supposed to serve. They aren't supposed to be served. And I think Jesus to me was the greatest example of that. I mean, he was God in the flesh and he came not to be served, but to serve. And the illustration of him washing the disciples' feet to me is is what I aspire to do, not literally, but, but as a leader. I want my organization, anybody in my organization to feel like, man, when I'm in the room, I am the most important person in the world to Kirk. And that's, I truly aspire to that. And and, I, and it makes me feel so good when people say things when they leave, like, man, I, I just want to thank you for treating me or remembering this or like that. That matters more than any business success to me is how people feel. It's not, it's not what you said or what you did. It's how you made them feel that, that really yeah. matters as a leader. And I think that's what I look back on my career. I couldn't tell you the shipments on my business in 1995, but I could tell you the people that worked on my business and maybe the person that got promoted or maybe the person that achieved a life milestone then. And those are the things through your career to me that the authentic, the humble, and the vulnerable mean. I mean, people want to know you're a human being. Yeah. They want to know you make mistakes. Yeah. They want to know you apologize. They want to know that you know you cry sometimes, that you you aren't always your best, that you make mistakes, but then you pick yourself up and you move forward because they, they want to have somebody to aspire to. And I mean, I can, I think back on my career and I can tell you the leaders, I can see them in my mind's eye who inspired me to want to be better. And, and I would run through in the proverbial walls or fire, whatever you want to say for them because of who they were, not because of the business we were on, not because of the financial rewards, but because of who they were. And I believed in them and they were authentic, humble, and vulnerable. They, they were all those things to me. And so over time, that's just how I think I've evolved because I've learned, I've, I've been fortunate to, to learn from great people. Thank you, Kirk, for today. It was great. It was wonderful. You're a good friend, and I think you, you, you helped a lot of us. Cool. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for listening. If this episode has impacted you, hey, share it with somebody else. All of us have influence, people that can look to us for direction. Use your influence positively, aggressively, and if this has meant something to you, then pass it along to those that you're leading. Uh, you can see more at bryantome.com or search me on Instagram. Special thanks to the band Judges for our music. You can find more from them on Instagram at The Band Judges or at Facebook.com slash The Band Judges. The Aggressive Life with Brian Tome is a production. 
of Crossroads Church, Cincinnati, Ohio. 